So we're glad that you're here today, and, and we're going to be talking about the Word of God today. And the um, pastor this month decided to go with the theme, the new normal. Not a resolution, but a new normal. Something that's going to become normal in our lives. And so I thought that I would take the Word of God today. And I titled this message, Face the Book Instead of Facebook. A new normal. Face the book instead of Facebook. You know, every year, Shirley and I go to the Y, and we work out a couple times a week. And in January, it's hard to get in. Everybody makes a resolution. I'm going to exercise. And I tell you, you can hardly get a machine to work on. Come February, you can walk into the YMCA. You can find any machine you want. Get on that treadmill. You can walk 10 miles if you want to. Nobody cares. And the reason for that is because, <clears throat> excuse me, those are resolutions. Now, if you're going to be at the YMCA January, February, March, April, May, June, all the way into December, it has to become the new normal. And the same thing is true with the Word of God. And I would like to uh, just take this thought today, face the book instead of Facebook. Maybe it could be a new normal for all of us. Now, some of you, you probably read the Bible constantly. And that is great. And I'm very thankful that you do that. But I'm sure there's people here today that may be new to Christianity. You may not uh, have set up a normal or a pattern in which you're reading the Word of God. And we would like to encourage you to take that time and to um, read the Word of God. Uh, last Sunday, Pastor Bruce said that he got a couple of illustrations out of Facebook for his sermon. You remember that? You all laughed about that, didn't you? Somebody put something on Facebook. Oh, I, I took that off Facebook. Well, I didn't want to go that low. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, what I'm preaching on today, the seed for the sermon, I got off of Facebook. And somebody put this on. The Word of God is alive and it's active. And I thought, you know, that'd make a great, great sermon. And so I got it off of Facebook. So I went as low as Pastor did, right? That, don't tell him I said that, all right? You know, you realize Facebook has been around for a few years. It started at Harvard University. And the gentleman that started that, it was just really pictures of people at the university. And... Um, pictures, and then it would describe a little bit about the person. It was called The Facebook. And then um, uh, he began to release that to other students there at the university, and before long there were hundreds of people that was following him at Harvard University. And then he decided, well, I'm going to make this available to other universities around the United States. And so he did that. And uh, there were Many, many universities that decided that they wanted to get involved in Facebook. And then, of course, he took it out to the public. And now you know what Facebook is all about. 1.79 billion active monthly users on Facebook. 1.79. There's 7 billion people in the world. So 1.79 billion people active monthly on Facebook. 4.5 billion likes generated every day. Every day. 4.5 billion. Not million, but billion. 1.18 billion log into Facebook daily. 1.18 million. We spend 927 million hours a month playing Facebook games. You send the most of them to me. <laughs> 927 million hours. The average time spent per visit on Facebook is 20 minutes. Every time you go into Facebook, the average time spent is 20 minutes. Well, think what that would be if you went on five or six times a, a day. There are 300 million photos a day downloaded to Facebook. 200 million of those are the ones I put on there. You can hide me if you want to. If you don't want to see them, that's fine. I'll go ahead and put them on there anyhow. But stop and think about 20 minutes every time that we go to Facebook. 20 minutes. 
And so if I spend a lot of time on Facebook, and I know there's some of you who don't spend any time on Facebook at all, but we could take other thing, Instagram, uh, the computer playing games, television watching sports, and all of these things that we're involved in, and just 20 minutes. If I could just take one time that I visit Facebook, 20 minutes, and put that time into the Word of God, think of how that might affect my life. Now, there's nothing wrong as far as Facebook is concerned, and I enjoy it, and, and I, I, probably, I don't know how many minutes I spend on Facebook a day. My wife tells me I live there, and um, I think she's right. But um, it, it, it's something that a lot of us are involved in, and some of you aren't. I understand that. And um, sometimes the senior people say, well, I don't mess with Facebook. Well, you know, they probably do off at the side. Nobody knows about it. But just think about 20 minutes. If I just take one time that I go on one visit and put that time on the Word of God. So I want to talk about the Word of God today. This book right here. Now, some of you may not have this book in your hand. You may not have brought it today. But um, some of you have it on an app, on your iPhone, on your Android. You have the Word of God available to you in many, many different ways. Justin just mentioned right now media. You version. This last January, I started reading through the Bible. My wife and I did. And we decided we was going to read through on our iPhones. And um, we was using you version. And I was reading the New Living Translation. But I had a little trouble with my eyesight in about March and April. And so I had to quit reading from there. But no matter how you receive the Word of God, whether it's through a book like this that you might have at your home or wherever it is, or whether you see it on your iPhone and the computer, YouTube, wherever it may be, this is important stuff. It's important for our lives. I've come to the conclusion that in our culture, that our culture despises this book. I've come to the conclusion that this book is taking the back seat in the thinking and the behavior of this culture in this country of ours. For some reason, people don't like this book. This book's always going to be around because it's God's book. But you are in the minority. And people will laugh at you because of this book. Because you believe in this book. Not only do you believe in this book, but you practice this book. And sometimes the things that you practice from this book goes against what the culture says that it should be. And so I want to share some things today about the book. About the Bible. About the Word of God. How important it is. And Justin, I appreciate your team today and, and the music and appreciate you sharing with uh, everybody out here, those of you that have little children, the opportunity to be able to uh, feed your children the Word of God and how important that is. Praying, reading our Bible, so important. Those are what we call disciplines. You have to be disciplined. And praying is talking to God. And reading the Bible, of course, is God talking to us. I hope that when we leave today, that each one of us might have a new appreciation for this book. This book changes lives. There's no other book in the world like this book. This book is a great and wonderful book. And sometimes we become so familiar with this book that we lose any appreciation for it. It becomes just an object to us. And so we want to talk about that for just a little bit today. I'm going to be reading a scripture. It's out of the Amplified Version. I don't know if you have that on your app, but go ahead and pull it up. I'd like for you to follow through with me. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. This is from the Amplified Version. And listen to it. It is filled with life and with action. For the Word of God is living and active and is full of power. Just think about it. We could just stop there. The Word of God is alive and it's active. It's powerful, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword 
penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both the joints and the marrow, the deepest parts of our natural exposing, of our nature exposing and judging the very thoughts and intents of our heart. What am I thinking? What am I doing and why am I doing that? What is the intention? The Word of God penetrates deep within us of the heart. And not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight. But all things are open and exposed and revealed to the eyes of him with whom we have to give an account. Wow. You could spend a year just to read and study those two scriptures and to draw from it for your life. First of all, the Word of God is alive. That describes what it is if you're following in the bulletin. The Word of God is alive. That describes what the Word of God is. It is inspiring. It will create you. Now let me explain that. It is inspiring. It will create you. And you may say, well, I've already been born. I'm not going to be created. Well, that may not be so in your spiritual life. And the Word of God is inspiring. And it will create you. Let me tell you why it is. The Bible says that this book is inspired of God. This is God breathed. This, is, this book is alive. It's alive spiritually. You see, sometimes we only look at this book as an object. Well, I'm going to read the Bible today. And I get it out and I start reading. I talk to Charlie. Hey, Charlie, I read three chapters today. It becomes an object. Oh, this book is more than an object. This book is alive. It's inspired of God. Listen to what the Bible says in um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture, that's what this book is. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. It is inspired of God. You know, Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam was created. Do you believe that? Or do you think some big bang came along and there he is? <laughs> no. Adam formed from the dust of the ground. God formed him. God took Adam, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. The breath of God. That's how the human being came into existence. Breathed into him. Inspired. Inspiration. Breathe. That's what the word inspiration means. God breathed. Inspiration. And so when the Bible says that the Bible was inspired of God, it is saying it has been God breathed upon. Breath. And it makes the Bible alive just like his breath made Adam alive. And Adam became a living soul. You see, that's why this book is different than any other book. When I say this book is alive, it is God breathed. That's what makes it alive. Just as he breathed into the nostrils of Adam, man became a living soul. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, listen to this carefully. For the prophecy, this book, came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Spirit moved and breathed upon the writers. And what they wrote was the very breath of God. And so the Bible is alive. That's what Hebrews chapter 4 says, verse number 12. The Word of God is living. The Word of God. Do you see this book as living? Most of the time we don't. I never did. I saw it as an object. When I was a little boy, about eight years old, we didn't have electricity. I remember that big round table we had. I took a little Bible out one day and I started reading. And um, for some reason, my parents didn't come along to help me. And I started in Genesis. And I started reading. I read about three chapters. And I didn't understand what it was saying. And to me, it was just an object. 
I put that Bible down for many, many years until finally one day I came back to it. And even then, I didn't realize that it's more than an object. Even though I treat it that way, it's more than an object. This book is alive. This book is alive. It's God breathed. You may pick it up on your iPhone app. It's still the same thing. It's God's Word. It's His Word. You see, it infuses God's life within you as you read it. Listen to this scripture. This scripture changed my life to a certain degree about 10 years ago. Listen to it. It is a spirit who giveth life. The flesh, what I live in, is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. John chapter 6 verse 63. Read it when you go home today. The words that I speak unto you, they are life. Jesus is speaking. The words that I speak unto you, they are life. And so I began to realize when I started reading this book that I was taking life within me. See, Jesus is the living Word of God, and this is the written Word of God. And the words that He speaks, He says, they are life. So where did my spiritual life come from? It comes from the Word of God. That's why I need to sometimes put Facebook down, have a new norm for my life, and start facing this book. It's so easy to get away from the book. I know you probably don't have that problem, but I do. I mean, it's, it's difficult sometimes. I'm a pretty transparent guy. You know, it's not always easy. It's alive. Now, here's the problem. Sometimes we take this book and we want to analyze it, we want to dissect it, and I want all the information and all that, and I, that's good, that's good. But there comes a time when you have to take this book and not dissect it and analyze it, but just take it in. For instance, Pastor Bruce comes up here Sunday after Sunday, and he feeds our soul, doesn't he? He really does. I prepared this message today to help feed our soul. But there comes a time when I can't be feeding your soul. I have to feed mine. And so how do I do that? I have to take this book. When I went to Baptist Bible College, I was 30 years old when I went, and I got... Uh, uh, through my studies in February, I was going to graduate in May and I quit school. And I was going through some real anxiety. Uh, I was uh, getting depressed and I just walked out. And uh, I had a good friend that finally came to my house and talked me into coming back and I did and I graduated and, and the rest is all history. But I, I learned this in Bible school and that's why I want to share it with you. In Bible school, I used this as a uh, textbook. I had to make grades. And so I had to study, not for my soul, but for my grades. And I got backslidden because it was an object. I wasn't taking the living, I wasn't seeing it as a living word of God, even though I was taking it in, but it was a textbook to me. And that's why I ended up like I did. And I wish somebody would help me with that earlier in my life. This book is alive. I want you to realize that. You see, when you take a flower, artificial flowers are pretty. And um, they do good work with artificial flowers. But if you take a uh, living flower that's alive, that you smell that flower and the aroma, you touch it, the softness of it, Pick it, hold it in your hand. You really give it a lot of respect. Why? You might have an artificial flower over here and it's just totally different. Because this one is alive. And so when you see the Word of God as something that's alive, we'll have a certain amount of respect for it. It's alive. The second thing I want you to see is that this book is active. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. The Word of God is alive and it is active. The Greek word is energis. In other words, it's powerful, energy. 
It describes what it does. When it says it's alive, it describes what it is. Now it says this is what it does. It's active. It has energy to it. Can you imagine this book? The lives that has changed down through the years. Can you imagine? Multitudes of people have been brought to God and to have learned about Him through this book. Why is that so? Because it's powerful. The Bible says it is active. It is transforming. It will change you. It is transforming. It will change you. You know, the Bible says that we're not to be conformed to this world. Isn't it so easy to be conformed to this world? I mean, you, you know, you stop and think about what the world does. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Do you know, that? the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. And there is. It's fun. You think sin. We wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't fun. But it's only for a season. But the Bible says we're not to be conformed to this world, to the world's thinking, and to the world's activity. We are to be transformed. Transformed. And how are we transformed? By the renewing of our mind. Well, how do you renew your mind? Through the pages of this book right here. Through the Word of God. Because it has power. It has power. Let me just give you a few ideas as to what this book will do for us. It activates God's life within us. This book will revolutionize your life. It really will. Here's what it will do. It will provide you a foundation for your life. Those of you that have children, little kids, now's the time to get the foundation laid. And the way you do that is through the Word of God. Through the Word of God. The foundation for your life. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him into a wise man which built his house upon a rock. It will give you a foundation. It will give you direction. Psalms 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto my path. The word of God is a lamp unto your feet. Right here. Your word of God will show you every step that you are to take. It's a lamp unto my feet. It is also a light unto my path. It will give you direction. It will show, shine outward. It will show you this is the direction I want you to go. If you don't go here, you're going to find darkness over there and over there. And so it is a lamp unto my feet for every step I take. And it is a light unto my path in the direction that I am to go. It will set you free. John chapter 8 verse 32. And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It will set you free. You see, I'm, I, I really believe. And Pastor Bruce does a lot of counseling. And he's very good at counseling. And I've done counseling down through the years. We have counselors that are members of our church. And it's good. But I believe this. That most of my problems that I've ever had in my life would have been taken care of if I'd have gone to the Word of God. You see, a lot of us live in prison. We live in prison because our mind keeps us there. Because we have ill feelings towards somebody. Or because uh, there's situations that, in relationships that we don't like. And our mind just, it, it, it's like a prison. And then it takes over and keeps us locked in that prison. Then it moves down into our heart. And there are our emotions and our feelings. And all that hurts us there. And we're locked in. And we don't have the freedom that God wants us to have. I guarantee if you look at this book, you ought not to ever be there. Now, we've all been there. It's not a good place to be. But really, the best way out of that is here. Because the Bible says the truth will make you free. And for some reason, we don't want to go here. For some reason, we want to go to somebody 
or to another person, and, and that's fine at times, but the first place we should go is to here. And we should stay here. We should face the book instead of Facebook. We should take some of that time and put it as a norm into reading our Bible. It will set us free. It really will. And then the last thing that it will do, the Word of God will give you rest. You have rest a day in your life. Is there any turmoil? Any agitation? You see, we live in a country of people being agitated. That's why you see a lot on Facebook what you see on Facebook. Because we're agitated. You've seen all the political world the last year. What's that all about? It's about a country that's agitated. Nobody can get along. We're just agitated. We're angry. Agitated. Where's the rest that God would want us to have? You realize when he was writing the book and, and, and in the early New Testament, those people were living under the Roman Empire. You think sometimes our government, you should have lived under the Roman Empire. But Jesus always let them know that you can live and rest under this situation because you're a believer. If you trust in the word of God. You'll find in chapter number 2. In chapter number 3. Of the book of Hebrews that we just read. Chapter 4. God said to the Israelites. You're not going to enter into my land of rest. He talks about resting. He said you're not going to do it because of unbelief. Because you will not trust me. You will not believe my word. You will not practice my word. It's not active in your life. And he said, uh, you're not going to have rest. And now he has the Jewish believers coming along. And he's warning them in chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. He said, if you're not careful because of your unbelief and you will not trust the word of God, you're not going to enter into the rest that God has for you. And then he goes into verse number 12 and he talks about the power of the word of God. I'm here to tell you that there had been many a time in my life that I was not resting. I was not resting. And the reason for that is because I wasn't trusting in the Word of God. In a sense of some unbelieving is what it was. And that's kind of sad because I didn't want God wants for our life. I was in my office 15 years ago. Pastor Luke Jane from Clearwater called me. And... Uh, he was talking to me, and I was griping about everything I could gripe about, you know. And uh, well, I was agitated. I wasn't at peace, and I wasn't at rest. And, and Luke said, hey, brother, what's the matter with you? You're not resting in Christ, are you? You don't have his yoke upon you. And I said, shut up. I don't have to listen to you. Just be quiet. Get off the phone. You're making me mad. <laughs> but you know something? I hung up that phone. And I realized that he was right. That he was right. Now, here's the thing. This book is alive and it's active. And it's sharp. It'll dig down inside of you. But let me say this. This book, being alive, you actually develop a relationship with this book. Not just an object. For instance, I've, I've worried a lot. And I just, it was just um, constantly when I was in my 20s and 30s and 40s, even 50s. And I think it's genetic. But I worried a lot. And I read the scripture in Philippians, be anxious for nothing. But through prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Pray, give it to Him. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep and guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I looked at that scripture and I said, God, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's not right. I worry. You're wrong. I'm right. <laughs> and uh, I really got under conviction. But that scripture, those two verses... They became a part of my life because it's living. And now when I worry about something, those are the verses I go to. 
Why? Because they're a part of my life. It's a relationship that I have with this thing that is alive. It's not an object. And so I want you to see the Word of God, whether it's on an app, YouTube, uh, version out of the book. I just want you to see this thing of being alive and, and excited about the Word of God. It's a great book. You should anticipate what is God going to do in my life when I open up this book. It's not an object. The Word of God is alive. And it's powerful. Active. It'll transform you. It'll change your life so that you can walk in a different direction. So my challenge today is this. That we might, those of you that read your Bible constantly, I know it sometimes we become so familiar with it that we lose the excitement of it. And so if you read your Bible daily, that you might have a new anticipation and a new appreciation of what this book is. And for those of you that are new to Christianity, or maybe you've been involved in Christianity for a number of years and you never open up the book, you never go to your app and read the Bible, you know something? Now's the time to start. Make it a new normal in your life. Not a resolution. But when you walk out of here today, say, you know, by the grace of God, I didn't know that book was so exciting. <laughs> I thought it was just church. No, this book is exciting. And I just really challenge us. There have been times in my life when it was a nothing but an object to me. Well, I could memorize it. I could even preach it. I told my wife, Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20, I, I'd preach that, I'm crucified to Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life that I live now. And I could preach that, you know. I had no idea what I was preaching. I just preached the words. Until one day that came alive in my life. And then I realized I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. I realized that was an exchanged life. I need to quit living my life and live His. And it became alive in my life. And it was active and it transformed me into who I am today. There's a book. Let me give it to you again, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. And Paul said, well, wait a minute. Nevertheless, I live. How's that work? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Is it changed? Living Christ's life. It's important. A new norm. I really challenge you, young people, children, adults. Look at this. Very exciting.